I'm really going to build upon what we've heard so far and in a sense also build upon some of the discussion which Alex Stevens introduced this morning. You'll remember he made the comparison between discussions and dialogues around this new issue and perhaps where the harms really lie. I'm going to try and extend those discussions and maybe ask, and this will make sense hopefully by the end of the talk, what's so novel about new psychoactive substances? Uh, it's a hot topic in every sense of the phrase. Uh, uh, my funded research is primarily in prevention and drug demand reduction. I'm really interested in that, it's what I'm most excited about. Uh, but I don't get invited to talk about that at conferences and seminars in the media. It seems every week I'm invited to talk about new psychoactive substances. What are the harms of new psychoactive substances? How do we tackle the perils and the threats of new psychoactive substances? And I'm very happy to do that. I think it's really important to have those sorts of discussions. But I think perhaps are we actually obscuring some of the real issues here? When we look at the practice, of course, as we know from the Wedenos analysis, yes, indeed, the number and nature of substances as emerging is, is interesting. And as a scientist, as somebody with a training in pharmacology, I do have some concerns around this. There's lots of uncertainties around toxicity, whether that's acute or long-term toxicity. For example, this was just a, a random seizure of drugs we uh, uh, analyzed from a, a well-known Northwest dance music festival. There's also concerns about different types of drugs and different types of user group. Uh, you may remember the case earlier this year, Eloise Parry, I think she was uh, from Shropshire, a student who died after taking a dietary supplement. So there are concerns here and there's issues that perhaps we need to pay, uh, pay, pay attention to. But I think the popular narratives around MPS, bearing in mind the data which Neve showed us around the low level of prevalence, is primarily focusing on the novelty and the uncertainties. And what I'm hoping to argue in this talk is probably the harms are very predictable. And hopefully I'll convince you later on. So if you look at popular narratives, uh, these, this is just a, a representative example. So young people, focus on young people, mind-bending drugs, harm, uh, new strategies from many police forces who no longer really engage with prevention, but release videos of people falling over, collapsing in the street, uh, familiar narrative. We even have Eton College, who've managed to find £150,000 to fund the University of Cambridge to look into the reasons why young people take psychoactive drugs. Uh, as a researcher, uh, very grateful that Eton College went to fund drugs research. I'm sure many schools here in Liverpool would love to have that sort of money to spend on PSHE, etc. Uh, there's also been a reframing of some drugs. Humphrey Davy and the salons of uh, Enlightenment London would probably be very surprised to see that his favourite laughing gas has now turned into hippie crack. New drugs, new phrases, new meanings and new interpretations. And then of course, as previous speakers have outlined, <laughs> trying to actually put a scope and a sense of what this impact actually means. We've really struggled with this. So Neil McKegney, who's a well-known researcher from the uh, Centre for Drug Misuse Research in Glasgow, in the Daily Mail column earlier this year, talked about legal highs or novel psychoactive substances being a scourge that could grow to eclipse heroin. You know, these substances aren't the new heroin. We still have heroin. That's where the problems are. There's been some really interesting academic analysis about how these sorts of issues have been discussed. Highly recommend these papers, I can send them to you afterwards. One by Alistair Forsyth, for example, uh, is a really nice paper looking at the narratives around this, echoing the sorts of things which Alex Stevens was talking about with regards to the reporting of deaths. And I think some of the reporting is creating this sense of uncertainty and uncontrollability around these substances in the market. Uh, very used to reports, a new legal high is discovered every week, or in fact it's two new substances are reported every week. And this is really useful information to know from a legal perspective. This is why the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drugs Addiction collects and publishes this data. 
It wants to have a good sense about how markets are changing so that countries, if they want to, they can really investigate this, develop legal responses. Whether you agree with those responses is another issue. So it has really important legal purposes and, and monitoring. But I think focusing on the increase in the types of drugs available is really obscuring our focus and our attention perhaps around the real issues. And I think largely this taps into a sense that we have around risk illiteracy, where we're unable to make sense of the scale, probability and likelihood of harm, whether this is respect to drugs, whether it's respect to the uh, a potential fallout from nuclear explosions or fracking, for example, as a society, as an individuals, we don't really have a good sense or a good handle of risk. We can't talk about risk and we can't relate risk to meaningful activities. And this gives a sense of thing that almost we're powerless to act or react to the emergence of all these substances. This is a threat which is never ending. This is the headlines and this is what the monitoring data is telling us. And that's why, of course, we have bills such as the Psychoactive Substance Bill, which Neve so eloquently critiqued. If we look at treatment data, we'll look, uh, Public Health England will be publishing new data next week in adults and young people. On this sort of indicator, uh, it doesn't seem to be too much of an issue. Uh, for example, in England, out of 200,000 drug treatment clients, only around 144 report MPS as a primary drug of concern. There's lots of issues about supplementary drugs and supplementary behaviours, of course. But in that sort of sense, it doesn't really seem to be an issue for treatment services, at least with regards to NDTMS. But if we move away from the headlines, if we move away from those simple indicators, and I'm somebody who's really interested in critiquing the literature, I'm one of those uh, geeks who would probably write a letter to the editor after seeing a study in a journal uh, which I didn't agree with. But I think away from the headlines, away from the discussions, we do have evidence that these substances are causing real harm in some groups. I don't expect you to read this, but I'll just pick out a few details. For example, in Dublin, uh, for the first time in quite a while, we're, we're uh, observing an increase in the incidence of HIV associated uh, with injection of these substances in homeless individuals. Uh, Wrapped just the other day published a report around 54 serious synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist related incidents in English prisons and prisoners. Uh, a, a nice study which was presented at the Society for Study of Addiction last week identified that around a fifth of presentations to mental health wards in one hospital in Edinburgh was associated with these sorts of substances. And I want to bring your attention not just to the nature of the harm, which is in many cases is quite serious harm, but the populations who are experiencing this harm. These, these are the populations that have always experienced drug-related harms. We're not talking about a new types of populations or new subgroups. And in a sense, the MPS, the legal high drugs, the problems that they're causing are exactly the same issues that these groups have always experienced. So by focusing on novelty, the ever-expanding market, perhaps we're ignoring the real issue, existing populations, existing harms. Uh, and probably at this point I could make comments around the comprehensive spending review and uh, uh, the removal of the public health ring fence and what this will actually mean in terms of provision of services, but that's probably a discussion for another day. But I just want to leave you with the point that, you know, we might talk about is this an overblown issue, but there are some real harms in key populations. Just as an example of this, if we look at Edinburgh, uh, so many of you might be aware that a couple of years ago, there was issues in Edinburgh that there was uh, quite dangerous and chaotic patterns of injection in existing injecting drug users, particularly focused on a drug called ethylphenidate, which is a stimulant drug, so individuals were repeatedly injecting this drug in unhygienic uh, environments. And it was subject to a temporary controlled drug order in April 2015. Uh, this, uh, according to police reports, pretty much removed ethylphenidate from the market and there was reductions in reports uh, to health services, etc. This was soon replaced, rather predictably, by the harms associated with a drug called 
methiopropamine MPA, exactly the same population, same sorts of behaviors, same harms, same presentations, just a new drug. You know, the issue hadn't gone away. The drug had changed, but the issues remained. Uh, as you may know, uh, a temporary controlled drug order was placed on MPA yesterday. It will come into force. And no doubt MPA will disappear from the market very quickly. Uh, one of the few successes of prohibitionary approaches is that the individual drugs do disappear. But already we're hearing accounts that in these particular markets around Edinburgh, there's new psychostimulants which have replaced this. Same issues, same problems, drugs are just changing. And in Scotland, they've really, uh, particularly around those issues around uh, Edinburgh, but in other populations as well. Uh, and I know Alex this morning who presented the contrast between the scale of problems, say compared to morphine and opiate deaths and MPS deaths. Uh, yes, and I acknowledge that in terms, relatively speaking, you know, we need to focus more attention on the larger public health issue around those sorts of drugs. But interestingly, in Scotland, they've actually looked at some of the death data around MPS in a bit more detail, uh, a lot more, uh, 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 lot more investigation than, than we do here with ONS data. And they've identified two key groups. So even though within those small numbers of MPS-related deaths, the deaths are primarily experienced by those individuals and those groups who are at high risk of traditional drug-related deaths. So if you look at the characteristics of the populations, that yes, you do get some atypical deaths, the clubbers who collapse and die, for example, but predominantly the deaths in Scotland, at least, are with benzo-like drugs, and the characteristics of users are very similar to those who die from opioid drugs. So they're known to services, they have previous overdoses, known to be intravenous drug users, and they have prior medical conditions. It's the same at-risk vulnerable populations again. So some of the work that we've been doing, particularly in the Centre for Public Health, but lots of interesting work going across, uh, across the country, and I know Michael and Al and colleagues have been doing some really interesting stuff in, in Greater Manchester. Uh, you know, this is a familiar list of populations who are at harm. This isn't just a standard list off the top of my head. These are populations and subgroups where there's evidence, robust evidence of emergence harm. And this is really where we need to focus upon with our services and responses. The rhetoric might be around young people, protecting young people and school children, but that's not really where the harms are being experienced with regards to these drugs. Other work which we're involved with uh, in collaboration with the European Monitoring Centre in Lisbon is to try and understand what are effective health responses. And we're hoping to report on this data uh, possibly in the early new year, with a full web resource uh, being launched around about April or May next year. And this is trying to bring, bring together guidance and best practice and evidence about how we respond and reduce these health harms in these key populations. Issues and settings such as sexual health clinics, prisons as we've spoken about, a real need to think about services offered in drug, treatments, uh, drug treatment settings. So what are some emerging lessons? Being as we know some of the harms, we can characterize some of the harms, and we know some of the populations where that's existing. Uh, and I think in some sense, the simple message to those of you delivering services, don't panic really, we already know what to do. Most of the activities and most of the evidence is suggesting that perhaps if we refine slightly some of our existing approaches, these are entirely suitable for dealing with some of the potential issues related to these new drugs. Just because the chemical formulas change, the toxicity and the harms don't change. We already have the tools and practices enabled to respond to some of the harms. Some of the key messages for me, and this is a message which really shouldn't be lost, and I know this is a strong message for this conference, is that classic harm reduction components are absolutely vital. Uh, and some of the things perhaps a, a lot more focus needs to be placed around, around the role of needle and syringe programs, particularly around equipment sharing and injection hygiene. Uh, 
Okay, just to, just to conclude, and I'm you know, more than happy to talk about this in a lot more detail in the question time or indeed afterwards. In my view, that the issues and harms around novel psychoactive substances aren't an issue of new drugs. Let's move away from the panic around new drugs and let's focus around what new behaviours are emerging or indeed what old behaviours are being hardened and legitimised through use of these drugs. As I mentioned before, health burdens are primarily in those same groups that have always experienced drug-related harm, particularly those with severe and multiple disadvantages. This won't come as a surprise to anyone in the audience here. And therefore, I'd also like to argue that the nature and probability of the harms emerging from these substances is largely predictable from a scientific perspective. We're not seeing new and novel harms the same types of harms that we always associate with use of drugs in some populations. We don't know how primary legislation will benefit these groups. Neve has already suggested that perhaps changes as a result of the Psychoactive Substances Bill won't make much difference. I think some of the experiences from Scotland around defalphenidate suggest, yep, that's going to be the case. But for those of you involved in providing services, I think it's more of an issue around drug cultural competencies. It's around understanding these new behaviours and that some groups may be using these drugs in slightly different ways, but it's understanding what are the cultural practices around these drugs and in these populations. So I think an existing effective practice really provides a solid platform for response. So thank you very much for listening.